What I'm going to do just briefly is introduce Frank D'Antonio. He's the market president for Aetna. He's sitting immediately to my left, followed by Bruce Hansen, the director of compensation processes at Boeing. And John Tessier, who is an orthopedic surgeon, Signature Medical Group, a Signature Orthopedic City Place, and Bali Yahia. I did get, did I get that right? Yes. Chief Medical Officer for Ascension Medical Group. We're moving from the exam table to the kitchen table. What does that mean? This is where we add value. Go into where the members are and being part of their everyday lives is what has reinforced that for us that, I gotta press the right buttons, reinforces for us that is your zip code that has more impact on your health care than your genetic code. You heard earlier, care is local. Care is deeply, deeply personal. Marshall's story is similar to most everyone else you know is out there, but everyone is unique in their own, their own way. Diet and exercise, 40% of what impact our health. Social and environmental, 20%. Those 60% of the social determinants impact our health and our well-being more than the 30% of the genetics do. That's why we're taking a holistic approach to healthcare. Mind, body, and spirit. Well, I think about the relationships our employees have in their healthcare I think about the importance of our employees having a strong relationship with a primary care physician, maintaining that relationship, and leveraging that relationship and all in their medical care. So it's very important for us. And so here's how, here's kind of three quick examples of how Boeing is tackling uh, that relationship between our employees and the primary care physician. Uh, Boeing has established uh, what we refer to as a preferred partnerships, uh, affordable care contracts uh, in Puget Sound. The second thing we're doing within our ACOs is encouraging employees to select primary care physicians. Every year in annual enrollment, we strongly encourage our employees to find a primary care physician. The second example of how we're building on the relationship between uh, employees in the PCO is through a new effort we've just taken on this year, uh, a direct contracting with a primary physician clinic uh, in an area not served by an ACO. And then finally, the third example I would mention is our effort around cost and quality transparencies. We're working to provide our employees a robust online tool that they could go into to look at cost of quality for a procedure for a doctor they're interested in. The uh, authorization piece with insurance companies in terms of getting permission for things where you really, I mean, so much time is spent in the office trying to not only explain to the patient, but then realize I've got to go to battle with them with some kind of peer review call to get permission for some kind of testing. So those challenges and the challenges of our relationships at times with hospital really you know, threaten our professionalism and I think take some of the joy um, out of the practice. In this decade, over a, a five-year period, um, the burnout rate in physicians has increased from 45% to 54% significantly higher than comparable statistics of other workers. I think the real uh, issue about how to fight this is to develop organizationally a physician engagement. A signature orthopedics uh, involvement with the uh, bundle um, uh, project has really um, demanded because we've never taken financial risks. We've always taken personal responsibility for the care and treatment, but we've never financially been at stake. And I think it's really required our physicians to become more engaged and more leaders in this. And we've transitioned into team concepts where we really have a fabulous uh, team of nurse case managers that we have everybody working at the top of their license together to deliver the most seamless care for this uh, entire episode, pre-op, post-op, how safe can we make it for the patient, um, 
How, how can we improve the outcomes? How can we make the experience better? We have a focus that we call the dual transformation, which is how can we start to prepare ourselves to better take care of not only of individuals, but of communities and of populations? And how can we move away from just delivering healthcare within our four walls, but to really create key partnerships and deliver and improve the health outcomes of the neighborhoods that we live in and the communities that we serve? One of the things that uh, we've rolled out is really um, online scheduling and mobile check-in, as well as a patient portal that allows you to interact with your provider via email. One of the big things that actually um, is really changing how we practice and how we approach access to care uh, is across the country this year we rolled out uh, various access procedures, and by that we mean extended hours, so we have some clinics that are operating until 8 o'clock at night that are offering um, Saturday or Sunday hours, uh, and also allowing flexibility within each uh, of our provider's panel that if someone walks in and needs to be seen, they can be seen by their doctor. There's two things that rise to the top that cause a lot of frustration. Number one is electronic health record and charting and coding, and then another is really all the paperwork that comes with the various approvals for um, different plans or contracts that they're in. Well, I'll go first. At Boeing, uh, we've got a pretty extensive well-being program, and we uh, focus on education. We focus on having events throughout the year that will engage our employees in better understanding their health, our annual health assessment, and follow-up uh, nurse counseling for employees that have something come out of that they didn't know that's important, and behavior changes that they can do to change this. I mean, it is a huge culture shift. Uh, Boeing is very much a bimodal organization. Got a bunch of employees, 45 plus, and we got a bunch of employees starting out their careers. We're really focused on the new generation of Boeing employees and getting them thinking about the right, a right ways to eat, to sleep, to come to work, what they do when they're sitting at their desk all day long, all those kind of things that become hopefully more of a standard for them than uh, earlier generations. Maybe just to, to piggyback on that, uh, from the macro level, you might have heard of the term health and all policies, because I think as a society and a country, we have to think about how do you start to link up the, the budgets and the activities of both education, of our parks, of our healthcare, and, and really think about how those link together, because if for many of my patients, uh, they don't have a safe place to walk. Uh, they don't have a, face, a safe place to go to the park. And there are no grocery stores that are by them that actually have healthy food options. So it doesn't, uh, it's not as easy as giving them a prescription and say, please go eat right, exercise. And so we really have to think about how do you start to link together some of these various social programs and really recognize that they're really health programs as well. 60% of, um you know, what happens to us in our health are, are, are social determinants. 40% um, of that being diet and exercise. If they're making those determinations of do I pay the heater, do I pay the rent, or do I buy my um, prescriptions, we need to know those. That's why what we're doing, um, you mentioned embedding, that's why we've sent all of our nurses home. We don't have our nurses come into the, the office any longer because what we want to have happen is our nurses are going to meet the people where they are. What electronic record has given us is data, and with data analytics, we've stopped and realized there's more evidence-based medicine that your risk factors for your comorbidities that can be modified, you're in a bad place on several of these things, and if you can improve on that, your risk factors are 18% less, 12% less. You get your anemia and your A1C and your uh, obesity and your smoking and you deal with the things that are modifiable. It's not that you have risk factors, it's that, it's that they're not in a good place. We can operate on people with uh, CHF, it's gotta be well controlled. But uh, you can't do that without engagement of the patient. So I think my deal is very much skin in the game, we got to make this as safe as we can because you don't want the complications because those are a nightmare for everybody.
the biggest challenges that we face is what's called interoperability of health information. And uh, I think a lot of people are working on it. Uh, in our organization, we have, I think, at least four different medical records. So even within one group, uh, we're in 22 states, uh, figuring out how to gather all that information is really, really hard. And as I said before, you know, um, no man is an island in healthcare today to really take care of populations you cannot really do it alone. We really believe in partnerships, whether they're other healthcare providers that are outside of our system or their um, social services and nursing homes, et cetera. Um, so I don't think we're there yet. There's some movement um, to create, and many of them exist, of health information exchanges that are ways to try to take some data, put it into a little bit of a pod, and, and then different people can access it. Um, there's some movement to um, new technologies that can that can think about like giving people a different key to your different parts of your record so different groups can see it. But this is one of the the very very huge frustration and actually adds to a lot of costs for healthcare um, because the amount that is spent on trying to actually get everyone into the data into one consistent data set so you can actually do analytics on it is exorbitant, especially for organizations have multiple systems. So I don't think we are there yet, but it's something that it definitely is on the forefront for, for many people. So Bruce mentioned the Business Health Coalition. I also have to give out a shout out to sister organization, the Midwest Health Initiative. Um, Louise and team have done a fantastic job trying to figure out um, those sorts of things and how we can accumulate data and then really use it. And uh, a lot of good work is, is, is happening through that organization. And if you're um, not participating either as an employer or um, a consultant or, or whatever your role is, I, I encourage you to, to do that. Technology is great, isn't it? It's fantastic um, when it works. And so we all have um, different sorts of, of, of technological applications that we use. Um, I think our, our application that we use for our members is, is great, um, but that works for our members. So back to your question of how do we go across um, the different um, carriers or employers and, and, and bring that all together. Um, I don't know the answer, but I do, what I do think is this. Um, when you saw that the three individuals that are coming in to uh, shake up healthcare uh, earlier in the presentation, um, I think there's gonna be a whole lot of technology and a whole lot of advances that are gonna shake up the system to make that happen. I think the coordination that I've seen with our nurse case managers, PAs, nurse practitioners, that collective group that just becomes a powerhouse of information and individualizing care, it has made a big part of my practice like a concierge orthopedic practice because the interfaces and the touches, managing the transitions postoperatively, things that we're, we see and know about the patient and their family that before did the case, patients discharged someplace, let's go back to the operating room, do some more surgery. And I think that the power of that team has just been uh, so impressive to me. And it's made me, I think, a better doctor and more engaged in really understanding. I think, you know, patients over paperwork. And one very practical thing that I think could be done is we now have more information on the quality of care and the cost for many of the different providers, but at those providers still have to go through prior approvals and secondary authorizations, et cetera. So we already know they're performing well. And so what programs can be developed that really allow them to kind of bypass that, understanding that they're utilizing healthcare resources wisely and putting the patient first. And so ways that you can start to um, remove some of those extra phone calls and forms that have to be filled out for those high performing providers, I think would go a long way. Um, the people who are not on the panel are some of the, the biggest cost centers in our healthcare system and some of the most recalcitrant uh, big hospital systems, um, pharma, device, um, and those are some of the biggest costs that we're dealing with and where people feel most trapped. What do people on the, how do people on the panel think we're going to deal with that? I mean, those are big, big numbers on hospital bills. The total continuum of care is, is uh, followed through. So I, I completely echo what you say um, on physicians and 
specifically patients, need to step up. Just yesterday I saw an email floating around from an employee that was having trouble getting an EpiPen. Uh, and so we've got resources that will go after that, try to get to the root cause of it, uh, and do what we can do as an employer to fix it. And I think to the extent we can get all of the employers engaged in being aggressive to address the obvious abuses like that, um, we can make change happen over time. I do think that what some of the things that you said in the book will start to empower people to ask those questions, but we do need some catalysts to kind of move us along. And so there's a couple areas of glimmers of hope for me. Uh, one are many of the large systems and employers are getting together to, to really think about forming a generic drug company that I think would be able to produce what other countries pay for the same, the same exact dosage of drugs here in the United States, which I think would go a very, very long way. Um, as I said before, I'm a, an HIV provider. I take care of patients, uh, and those medicines are ridiculously expensive. But if you go over to Africa or India, those same medicines are you know, pennies on the dollar compared to what we have today, and they're life-saving. Um, similarly, for the interoperability piece, um, and I didn't realize this until I dug into it a little bit more, you know, the cable industry, you know, Comcast, all, all those different things, they're actually, back in the day, used to be different jacks that you had to plug into the wall. There was not one consistent one. And today, you can pick up any TV, which regardless of the maker, and you know that when you go to your apartment or house and you plug it in the wall, it's going to connect and you're going to see a picture. And so similarly, leveraging kind of insights from the cable industry, a large group of very large healthcare systems, including ourselves, are getting together and thinking, because we have purchasing power, um, can we start to standardize how all these different medical devices and things plug into these EHRs so we don't need to come up with an adapter to fit it in there? So I think there's some movement. A lot of, a lot of uh, socially conscious institutions are out there trying to figure out how can we accelerate the pathway uh, for the things that just, you know, they're da, they make sense, we have to do it. So I think those are a couple things to consider. Today, uh, Kaiser in California, total joints, total knees, total hips, 80% of those cases are done as an outpatient. You go home the same day, and the rest of them go home the next morning. And that's a cultural thing that as those pressures, and we're looking towards six years from now where half of these are done outpatient surgery, same day surgery. Uh, as surgery centers get into this, I think that transparency on cost and the implants is going to be out there. And people are saying, you know what, we're simply, we can't justify uh, getting choked by this uh, hospital bill that's eight times more than what it can be done over here. And they're doing it just as safe with the same outcomes or better. So uh, I think that transparency is going to help drive some of that uh, price compression.